Welcome. My name is George Vendura, and I'm a storyteller. I go on the name George from the Bronx when I'm telling my stories. I'm here to present to you Carlisle's first annual storytelling event. It goes under the name of Voices of Experience. It's presented by the Carlisle Council on Aging. And the work there was done by Carol Brunak. Another person of importance is Chuck Bajanski. Chuck is filming this, and he's also going to be the editor. Finally, another person of importance is Philip Markle. He was the teacher that coached these speakers for the last six weeks and, and brought it to the fruition where we're finally presenting tonight. All that being said, let me introduce you to my first storyteller. It happens to be a rock. Now you might say, what does a rock have to do with storytelling? What's this guy trying to do? Well, there's a basic understanding or misunderstanding about storytelling. People view storytellers and say, oh, I wish I had such an exciting life. I wish I could tell a story, but my life is so plain. I have no adventures. I have no stories. That's not true. Let's use this rock as an example. This rock is an object and as an object, it doesn't have much life and it doesn't have much interest. It's just a garden variety rock. And my father, for one, would see it that way and sort of kick it aside or throw it in a rock pile on the side of the shed. But my mom, oh, my mom, wow, wow, wow. This is a rock. Just look at it, feel it. Look at the points on it and how it's rough over here and smooth. Just, just shake it back and forth and. And, and get your fingers around it. And not only that, give it a smell. It smells a little like dirt in the garden. It's, it's, it's a beautiful rock. And underneath it, you'll look. There might be a worm or a spider or a sow bug, or maybe if you're lucky, a snake. So a rock is an object, but no, a rock is more than that. It tells a story. There is a story. And the story comes from your relationship to the rock, your experience of the rock your point of view of the rock. You can take something very bland and somebody says, like my dad, it's bland, it's useless. And somebody else will say, it's beautiful. Let me tell you why. So that's what storytelling is. It's not the adventure of the excitement of the thing, it's the adventure and the excitement of the experience and how you feel it and then express it. I think it was, I think it was, who was that guy? I think it was, um, it was Will Rogers, and he had this profound thing that he said. I never met a man that I didn't like. Well, I think my mom and I would say, we never met a rock we didn't like. That being said, let me put this silly thing down. I gotta be careful where I put it. My dad finds it, he's gonna toss it in the garbage. If my mom finds it, my Italian-American mom, she's gonna put it in the brazier. Yeah. For my next speaker, we have Dan Barlow. Dan uh, comes to us from Bristol, Connecticut. He's only been in Carlisle for three years and he is an insurance uh, person. He was, the, um, he was the director of risk management in his company in Hartford, Connecticut. He uh, is gonna tell a story about his very young days. He was a young guy and he had two older brothers that of course he wanted to emulate. These guys were athletic and he wanted to be an athlete too. So he tried to follow in this footsteps and he tried and he tried and he tried. I think you'll enjoy the story of inspiration from Dan. Thank you, George. You're welcome, sir. Poop and pee. I call these the two P's. More specifically, the veterinarian's two P's. Because every time we bring our puppy to the vet, the first thing he or she asks is, is your dog peeing and pooping on a regular basis? Now, I know it's important for dogs and for all of us for that matter, to poop and pee on a regular basis. But my story is not about the two Ps of pooping and peeing. It's about the two Ps of persistence and perseverance. So I grew up in the 1950s in Manchester, Connecticut, a suburb of Hartford, I was uh, the fifth of six children, and I had two older brothers who were both players on the Manchester High School football team. Uh, 
And we would go to the games. The games were so exciting. There was crowds of fans. The team would come out with their uniforms and their helmets and shoulder pads, knee pads. And uh, there was some football and a kickoff, the marching bands, the cheerleaders. It was so exciting. I wanted to follow in my brother's footsteps and someday be a high school football player. Well, during the summers before football season started, my brothers would go down to the local football field and they would let me tag along and they would do calisthenics, jumping jacks, sit-ups, push-ups. They would count how many they could do and I, I couldn't keep up with them. We would do laps. The most fun part was throwing the football around, catching passes and, and trying to kick through the goalposts. It was a lot of fun. I, when I turned eight, I, start, I tried for midget football and my dreams of being a following in my brother's footsteps were dashed in an instant. After a grueling two hours with players who were bigger than me and were more experienced and knew what they were doing, I was exhausted. And the coach came over to me and said, Dan, midget football is hard and it's not meant for everybody. I, I was just crushed. I couldn't believe my ears. I was not going to be a football player. It took me a while to, re to reconcile with that, but I did at eight years old, and I uh, decided to try baseball. So I tried for farm league baseball when I was eight. I did not get drafted. I tried again when I was nine. Again, I did not get drafted. Now, during the summers and the springs, one of my brothers would play catch with me every day, and I practiced trying to be a pitcher. And I practiced and practiced, and he was patient enough to spend hours with me uh, working on my, my ability to pitch. So when I was 10 years old, I tried out for Little League, and sure enough, Coach Benson called up one night and told my mother I had been drafted onto the Aceto and Sylvester Little League team. I was just so excited. I couldn't believe that uh, I was actually on a team after trying out for two years. I got a uniform. It was meant for a kid 50 pounds heavier than me, but nonetheless, I had a uniform, a, a cap, and uh, I had uh, baseball, uh, uh, shoe, uh, baseball shoes with rubber cleats, and, um, and I went to practices. Everything was perfect except for one thing, and that was that I just could not play well. So uh, Coach Benson, everybody got to play two innings, and I got out into right field for the fifth and sixth inning of every game. I prayed that nobody would hit the ball out there. And one time a ball did get, a pop fly came out. Sure enough, I missed it. I picked the ball up and I threw it as hard as I could into home plate. And I was so nervous when it came in at the end of the inning that I was going to be um, criticized for missing that ball. I felt really bad about it. But Coach Benson said the perfect thing. He said, Dan, you threw a perfect throw to home plate. I felt a lot better. So uh, in my last year, when I was 12 years old, uh, I went to the first practice and my brother came to pick me up at the end. And he said, did you tell Coach Benson about how you can pitch? I said, no, no, I, I, I'm a, I wouldn't do that. He said, well, go tell him. So I went to Coach Benson. He said, yeah, come on out. Let's, let's see what you can do. So I was pretty ner I was really super nervous, but I threw the ball and lo and behold, I guess all of that practice uh, paid off because it was a perfect throw. And then Coach Benson would ask me to hit the corners and I was able to do it. And I felt pretty good, but I didn't know, he didn't say too much. So I didn't know whether I would ever actually start a little league game. Well, sure enough, the next game, Coach Benson said, Dan, you're gonna start. Again, I was so nervous. I, I had never started a Little League game before. I was, it was the last person you would expect to be starting as a pitcher for the team. But I went out to the mound and that first pitch, I was afraid it was gonna be a home run. It was a low pitch. The batter hit it to shortstop and it was thrown out uh, on that one pitch. At the end of the inning, three batters up, three batters down, four pitches. It was uh, a great relief to me. And we won the game. I only allowed one run. 
And that season, our team had a winning season, and I started several games and was had a good uh, pitching career that summer. That summer, when I was 12 years old, my, my baseball career uh, at post Little League never went very far. But that summer, when I was 12 years old, turned out to be one of the best summers of my life. And over the past 60 years since that summer, the two P's of poop and pee, I mean, the two P's of persistence and perseverance have proven to be uh, very uh, beneficial to me in everything that I've uh, tried to do. Thank you. Excuse me, I was sharing a little moment with my friend here. Uh, to you in the audience, please join us again for the continuation of our show, which will be next week on March 16th at 7 p.m. Thank you very much for coming. Bye now. All right, welcome everybody. It's great to see so many people here. And this is part two of our first annual storytelling event. And we have six storytellers this evening who participated in a six week storytelling course. We got a grant from Chana 15 and we were able to get then Philip Markle, who is from the Brooklyn Comedy Collective to come and teach a storytelling course. And this was a great program that the Carlisle Council on Aging was able to offer. And our storytellers worked hard crafting their stories. They worked hard on learning to present stories. And I think they had a fantastic time doing it too. So here we are tonight and they're going to share some of that positive energy and all the things that they learned. And I would like to thank them for all participating in this event as well as George Vendura, who is our MC this evening, and Chuck Benyassi, who is doing the production. Um, I would like to remind everybody to please keep your self muted. It is distracting if there's some <clears throat> extra noises. And I think with that, I'm gonna pass the microphone over to George. Good evening. My name is George Vendura, and yes, I myself am a storyteller. I perform under the stage name of George from the Bronx. And as Carol said, we're here for the first annual storytelling event of Carlisle, Massachusetts. To be a little redundant, I want to thank Carol, Carol Grunike, for organizing this and, and working so hard over the last six weeks to make it happen. Uh, I'd also like to give credit to Chuck Banyansky, who is now recording and will be editing this show. And finally, to Mike Markle, the teacher who taught for the last six weeks, and he is associated with the Brooklyn um, Comedy Collective. That being said, before I introduce anybody, I'd like to give you a little understanding of how storytelling is important. Okay. My lovely Polish bride, Jeannie, has a grandmother, a father's mother, and she tells me so many times that this grandma was really, really, really a saint. So like, this is a spark in my brain, a saint. And so it, it behooves you to explain what a saint is. So I ask her, what do you, what do you mean by saint? Tell, tell me something, flesh it out. Tell me something about your grandmother. And she said, well, everybody said she was a saint. She's, she's a saint, George. I said, I heard that, but I mean, what, define saint for me. Give me a little bit of a background. Did, did she smile a lot? Saints smile a lot. Did, did she make wonderful apple pie? Did she tell you bedside stories? Did she hug and kiss you? Did she, you know, did she bear pain, you know, gracefully? What do you mean by saint? But there's only this word, saint. So I go to her brothers and sisters. She has six. And they say, tell me about your grandma. And they say, oh, she was a saint. And we're back into this same situation. Well, what we need a little bit is, tell me about this woman's husband and how she felt about her husband, how she felt about children, her children. What were her dreams? What were her aspirations? Everyone has had a broken heart and so did grandma. 
everyone had jobs that went terribly, terribly bad. And so did grandma. Everybody had problems and, and issues with their mothers and fathers and children and, and everything else. And so did grandma. Tell me how grandma felt when she saw the Statue of Liberty. Tell me how grandma felt when she was herded through Ellis Island and when she struggled with English when she finally got to Pennsylvania and how people picked on the Polish people maybe in Pennsylvania and about the coal mines and about the heartache in the emergency rooms and the hospitals. Then I know who grandma is and I know what combines into the word saint. That's why we're storytellers. We're, we're trying to show the connection. We're trying to share our hearts and souls with others so their hearts and souls will connect with you. We're trying to show our humanity and that's reflected in their humanity. We're sharing our emotions. We're sharing our epiphanies so that both the reader as well as the storyteller says, yeah, yeah, I feel just the same word. Oh, that happened to me. That's why storytelling is important to pass on this information, to share this information, and to be at one in the family of humanity. That being said, I'm almost ready, but not quite ready, to introduce our first speaker. First, I have to tell you a little bit about myself. That has to do with the first speaker. I was born in the Bronx. And you know what? I think the Bronx is the greatest place in the world. Everybody there is as cool and nice as I am. That's not so. What happened is I moved to California. And for 40 years, I was in California. And there's a completely, completely different culture. It's not the Bronx. It's California. Now, people don't think that there's a culture in California. There is. They have a different pace. And they have a different value system. Believe it or not. I mean, not totally different, but quirky, you know, a little twisted. And so when you're there, it's like a speed bump. You, your heart and your mind gets from whoop, whoop, because it's different. It's a different culture. And their, their work ethic and their play ethic is different. When you go to a California sometime gathering, let's put it this way, when you're in the Bronx or on the East Coast, even in Boston, and you meet somebody, you usually say, oh, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm a scientist or I'm an engineer or I work for Smith and Jones. And then the conversation continues to tumble. And then you get an idea and that's the way it usually starts. That's the East Coast culture. When you go to California and go to gathering, the first thing they ask you is, do you ski? No. What kind of car do you drive? Now, there's nothing wrong with this. There's not bad. It's just a different culture. It's a hiccup. It's a bump in the road. Why am I saying this? Because now I'm going to introduce you to Margie Yamatomo. And Margie has the reverse mentality. She was born in California. And she moved to Boston. And boy, is she hitting speed bumps. It's very, very entertaining to hear Margie's point of view from her California culture to the Boston culture. And she'll tell you that there's speech problems and there's driving problems and there's also job interview problems. But she survived. She is a, a survivor, to say the least. And she has a humorous bent to her personality and it'll also show in the story. So without further ado, Margie, please speak to us. Thank you, George. When I moved to Boston almost 40 years ago, I want you to know it wasn't of my own free will. No, I didn't have a gun to my head, but it sort of felt like it. I was born and raised in California and I had my own business in San Francisco. But the man I was going to marry was born and bred in Boston, and he had his own business here. The deciding factor came when we compared bank accounts, and guess who won? Being a native Californian living in Boston has always offered unusual challenges. In the beginning, like with everyone else who moves here, it was learning to say Haverhill and not Haverhill or Leminster and not Leominster. I still find it funny that Worcester is Worcester, but Dorchester isn't Duster. 
There was a time when we were invited to a costume party and we were asked to wear something that reflected our ethnic backgrounds. My costume was obvious. I just threw a kimono over my regular clothes. My husband was having a tough time trying to decide what to wear to show his ethnic heritage. I told him it's easy. He could wear anything from L.L. Bean. Driving in Boston is a whole other category of cultural shock. The only role model I had was my husband, who's a typical Boston driver. His every man for himself approach to traffic circles terrorized me. Remember back when we had toll booths? His favorite game was to drive up to one of the booths, toss his coin into the basket and make it through the toll gate without ever slowing down or stopping. And his attitude about traffic lights. I had learned that the amber light, you know, the one located between the red and the green, it means stop, the light is turning red. To him, it means hurry up, you can still make it, who cares if the light turns red? When I made my first solo drive into Boston, I was terrified. At that point, my husband was my only example of survival driving in Boston. To protect myself, I decided to use my best California defensive driving tactics. You know, the one that follows all the rules. At the toll booth, I came to a full stop and put my money in the basket. I did have to ignore all the cars behind me honking their horns. On the streets, I stayed within the posted speed limits. Of course, almost every other car was either tailgating or whizzing past me. But I survived. When I got home, I proudly announced to my husband I wasn't afraid to drive in Boston anymore. Puzzled, he asked me why. I told him, because I realize I don't have to drive like you. As a newcomer to Boston, the one area I did feel confident about was finding a job. It had never been a problem before. I had more than 20 years experience in marketing and communications in San Francisco and New York City. I almost always got the job I wanted. In Boston, I began by sending out my resume. The ads I answered had jobs descriptions that sound like they were written just for me. After a few months with no responses, my husband suggested I send my resume out under my married name. I had been using Margaret Yamamoto. So the next day, out it went under the name Margaret Y. Hopkins. The phone began to ring. I had several interviews immediately. It was with these interviews our suspicions were confirmed. One interview was at a prominent psychiatric hospital in the area. I had already had a telephone interview with the director and it went well. But when I walked in to meet him in person for the first time, he almost fell out of his chair. The interview was short and dismissive. After I endured more meetings like that one, I decided to take my chances using my real name, Yamamoto. As a result, I did get a call from a public relations agency where I met with the vice president. He told me he was interested in talking to me because he thought his clients from Japan would be more comfortable dealing with someone who spoke their language. I had to tell him my second language is German, not Japanese. I had an interview at another company where the human resources person admitted he thought because my last name ended with a vowel, I was Italian. Despite this discouraging beginning, I did eventually find good jobs in my field in the Boston area. I know it's been nearly 40 years but not much has changed, changed with other people's expectations of who I am. 
Today, when people ask me where I'm from, and I answer California, I can feel their disappointment because they still expect a more exotic answer like I'm from Japan or some other mysterious Eastern country. Maybe I should just say I'm Italian. Thank you. Thank you, Margie. That was a great story. Our next storyteller is from Schenectady, New York. And she has been in Carlisle for about 20 years. She was a marketing manager for high tech companies. And for a long time, she was a mosquito reporter. Her name is Seal, Cecile Sandwin. Now, this Sandwin story centers around her mystery mother. Her mother was, um, she was, her mother had 11 children. So Cecile is one of 11 children and Cecile is the oldest. And her mother was never the warmest person. She was extremely intelligent and extremely accomplished. Uh, she was a doctor, a medical doctor in Schenectady, and she actually helped a lot with rather poor people. So there's a lot that Cecile knows about her mom, but she's still a bit of a mystery. So it came about that mom was going to have a retirement party, and Cecile was going to be the oldest, still the oldest child. And she was tasked with finding out some more of the details of mom and, and just scope her out and flesh her out for the speech. And in the process of doing that, she found a lot about her mystery mom and got very much closer. So without further ado, Cecile, tell us your story about your wonderful mother. Okay. Thank you, George. That was a great intro. And uh, thanks to everybody who showed up today. Um, my story starts when I was in my 30s, and as George mentioned, I was asked to give a little talk at my mother's retirement party. Now, my mother was a well-respected, you know, doctor. She, uh, she and her partner catered to the poor of Schenectady and were really respected for that, but also the fact that she was the mother of 11 was always... Uh, something I think most people really found unbelievable. So as the oldest, I guess I was tapped and uh, I set out to learn a little bit more about my mother. So I have to say there were many things about her I never quite understand, <laughs> quite understood at that time. Um, you know, she, during my childhood, she always was at home. She wasn't working as a doctor, raising our, you know, all the kids. And she was a very reticent, reserved person. And for somebody so accomplished and so intelligent, very socially awkward and really avoided social situations, parties, anything like that. And the other thing I found a little mysterious about her was why all these kids, you know? <laughs> Not that there were any I really wanted to send back, but I never noticed that we made her all that happy. She seemed often to be in a bad mood. And when she got in a bad mood, she'd start vacuuming. And so when you heard that vacuum coming around the corner, it was like time to head for the hills. So to find out a little more about my mother's childhood, I talked to her sisters, my aunts, and my dad, and I found out a few things I hadn't really known about her. I mean, I knew she had grown up really poor in a house in Vermont with no electricity, heat, no indoor plumbing, um, and I knew that she had worked hard throughout her childhood as the oldest of six kids. But what I hadn't known was, you know, when in South Shaftesbury, Vermont, they really didn't know what to do with a gifted child like she was. So every time she learned everything in a certain grade, they bumped her up another grade. 
So uh, this happened a few times until she entered high school when she was 12. And at every stage of her life from then on, she was always the youngest and ended up graduating from medical school when she was 23 years old, probably one of the youngest doctors UVM's ever graduated. So I thought about this and wondered, you know, what must it have been like? You know, she'd gone to a one room schoolhouse to enter high school as a 12 year old. And she must have been kind of an oddity. And then she got a scholarship to Bennington College. I know there she always felt like the ugly duckling among swans. And then to enter medical school at a time when most of her classmates were coming out of the army, having put their lives on hold for a number of year dur years during World War II. So not only was she the youngest, she was, you know, one of only three women in her class. So I kind of thought about this and realized that at every step, she had been an outsider. At, a t at an age when most of us are feeling part of a group, making friends, developing social skills, she was just heads down working on her career. And, uh, it, you know, it just was her complete focus. So the night of my talk, things went very well. You know, I, my talk was well received. But what I really appreciated was hearing from her colleagues because she, I found that they were people who really appreciated her kind of Vermont sense of humor, you know, had tons of stories to tell about uh, her tough love way of approaching patients, seeming not to care when she cared a lot. And uh, I realized that late in life, she had really found a group that appreciated her for herself. And at the end of the night, the 11 of us got together for a photo. You know, the 11 of us kids, we were all there. And later on, looking at that photo, I thought to myself, you know, here are, you know, people who are all contributing members to society, all great people that, you know, I love to have a beer with any one of them. And uh, maybe that's, you know, the best legacy of all. So thanks, Mom, and I get it now. <clears throat> Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you for a great story. That was very nice. I appreciate it. <clears throat> For our next story, I got to tell you again a little bit about the Bronx. <clears throat> the Bronx is a very classy place. It's the land of gentle people like me. But people confuse it with Brooklyn. They think it's sort of like the same because they're both New York City boroughs. They think it's sort of like the same because they're close together, just right over a little border. Let me tell you something. Brooklyn is not the Bronx. You don't want to go to Brooklyn. They don't talk. They talk funny. They walk funny. They smell a little bit. Brooklyn is not the Bronx, no matter how close they are. People from the outside don't know it. In the Bronx, we have class. We eat with our hands. In Brooklyn, they eat with their feet. Bronx isn't that bad. You only get mugged once or twice a week. In Brooklyn, you get mugged every single day. Why am I telling you all this? Well, because our next speaker is Dana Booth. He's a regular guy, a nice guy, and he's associated with the UU Church in Carlisle, I mean, Concord, Massachusetts. And they have this relationship with Romania, where they are sponsored high school and college kids. So, he has been a representative of our country to Romania six times. And it appears like Romania is sort of like the Bronx. It's a rather nice place. But Dana always wanted to look on the other side of the fence. 
for some reason, he always wanted to go to Ukraine. No big deal. Romania, Ukraine, you walk over the border. Listen to Dana's story about the difference between these two countries, and you'll laugh. Thank you, George. I hope not if I can live up to your introduction. Thank everyone for coming here. I appreciate it. Hopefully you'll appreciate my little tale. On June 25th, 2019, while on a Daniel River cruise with my Transylvanian family, the Chuckas, Joseph and Giselle and their two children, Ishtan and Yulia, I asked if we could go to Ukraine on our return trip as we're quite close. Unfortunately, they forgot their passport. Or maybe they did it was intentional. Joseph said we could drive through Moldova to the Ukrainian border. Great. At least I could look at the Ukraine. Entering Moldova, piece of cake. When we arrived at the Moldovan Ukrainian border, I asked the Moldovan border guard, who spoke fluent American from watching American films, if he thought I could walk the 200 yards to the Ukraine border where I would ask to have my passport stamped. He thought my plan was plausible, but to complicate matters, in February, they had a shot of cortisone to alleviate an acute bout of sciatica, which now had worn off. So with cane in hand, I hobbled towards the Ukraine. Upon arriving at the Ukrainian border, I asked if anyone spoke English. Yes, was his reply. I explained I have cancer. I was about to start treatment when I got back. I did not think I'd ever be able to return to fulfill a wish to visit his country. That the Romanians with whom I was traveling had forgotten their in Ukraine. I asked if it were possible to have my passport stamp to prove I've actually been close to or into the Ukraine. Of course, follow me. And followed him, I did with a smile on my face. My passport was immediately stamped with bright red Ukrainian seal, with the entrance seal. I thanked him. I, then I asked for the exit seal. Oh, 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 you're going to have to see her, he pointed to a vacant desk. She'll be back in five minutes. Well, the five minutes slowly became 10. 15, 20, suddenly the light went up in the brain, uh-oh. 30 minutes, an hour, suddenly this adventure had turned into a Hollywood version of a Russian interrogation camp. Finally, a robust female confronted me in a thick accent. What you doing here? She repeated my story. She scanned my passport and stated, so you're American military. I politely stated, I'm not military. My passport is civilian. I'm simply trying to leave. After another 20 minutes, she returned with a form, then directed me to leave on the other side of the building, in the direction of Kiev. The not so low moist in my head, so this must be a nightmare. Simply wake up, Dana. You'll be and work that way. So I hobbled another hundred yards to another gate guard who also spoke fluent American. Give me the two pieces of paper. I politely replied, because I'm given one. But you need two. I only have one. I cautiously retold my story, ending that I was only trying to leave here. Finally, he believed me. He took a scrap of paper, wrote USA, and told me to retrace my steps. Whew. Finally, I'm headed in the right direction. When I re-entered the border guard building, I encountered a burly guard showed him a bit of paper. He shoved me into another room with three different guards. They took my passport, rescanned it, and demanded, what you doing here? I politely explained again that I was trying to leave here. So you're American military? No, my passport's civilian. Then the door opened and a younger, also burly guard forcibly grabbed me on the right shoulder, shoved me down the hall into a smaller room where a large, but for typically Russian interrogator took my passport and scanned it. He glared at my wide open eyes and asked, so what are you doing here? 
I politely, but probably with a detectable tremor, my voice repeated the whole saga. He called in yet another old guard who reviewed the information displayed on the passport scanning screen. He too asked me what I was doing here. I did not waver. After what seemed like an eternity, the first guard had encountered into the room, accompanied through yet another room. The passport was stamped with a red exit arrow. At last, my five hour five hour ordeal was over, except I desperately needed to use a bathroom. I could not wait. I asked for a bathroom. He pointed to the white smoke cement block building I'd passed on the way into the border guard shack. As I left the building, I thanked him for his help in English, not Russian. I do speak some Russian, but certainly not this day. I did stop at the white building just long enough to leave my mark on the Ukraine. As I finally hobbled back to freedom, I could see huge smiles on Chaka's faces. In my absence, Yuli had spoken to the Moldovian border guard who said he knew one of the guards in the room, Ukrainian side and had called. I think his call precipitated my release. Will I go back? Yet. So be very careful for what you wish. My end. I'd like to thank the Council on Aging for this, the support of this and all they're doing for the elders in this town. Thank you. And Thank you, Dana. That was a great story. I appreciate it. <clears throat> You're welcome. We've all heard about the story of the Good Samaritan. What happened is there was a person in need. A lot of people neglected to stop or even look at him, stepped over him, and he was ignored, and perhaps he was dying. And then this lower caste member of society, a Samaritan, came by and actually pitched in and helped him, gave him his clothing and took care of him and possibly and probably saved his life. It's a nice story. I mean, we've all heard it. But when you think of it, how many times have we passed people by in need? Because there's always some sort of time problem or, or scheduled thing going on, or perhaps there's danger, there's risk. It's not easy to stop and, and, and get involved because you don't know how far it's gonna go and how much you need it. This is important because our next storyteller is Marsha Walhagen. And Marsha will tell you how a sweet, wonderful, sunny snow day in New Hampshire turned into a challenge where she was called upon to lend a hand. Without further ado, Marsha, tell us your story, please. Thank you, George. The year is 2019, the end of March, pretty close to the estate. My husband, Bob, and I are in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. We are staying at Mittersill, and he is going to do some skiing after a long winter. I'm going to do some relaxing time and do a little shopping. The night before, there was a lovely snowstorm up on the mountain. In the morning, Bob and I are driving over to Cannon, and it's beautiful. For those of you who ski, it was your perfect ski spring day. The snow was glistening. People were on the slopes, kids were screaming, people were cheering, traffic everywhere. As we drove over, I noticed, and so did Bob, that somebody was stuck in the snow. We drive over, I drop him off, and I wish him a great day of skiing. I had given up skiing 20 years before. I'm off to shop. As I'm driving back, the truck that I had seen was still stuck. I look over and in the truck is a woman sobbing, spinning tires, snow flying everywhere, traffic going by, no one has stopped. I pull over, I get out, she's crying. I say to her, there's not much I can do, but I can give you moral support. 
She's crying. I said, do you have a shovel? She says, yes, I do. I said, okay, we can start to dig you out. She pulls out her shovel. For those of you in Boy Scouts, it's the tiny Boy Scout shovel. So she starts digging. Now I know there's probably four wheel drive in that truck, but it's her husband's truck. I'm not going near it. Traffic's going, no one's stopping. A car stops. A woman says to me, do you need some help? I said, do you have a shovel? She says, no, she doesn't have a shovel. But she would go up and tell the people at the ticket counter, perhaps they could send somebody down. I was thrilled. As it turns out, another truck stops. Woman says to me, do you need some help? I said, do you have a shovel? She says, no. But do you have a rope? Well, my good husband, we had a tow hitch in the car. So I get it. We connect them to the trucks. She says, now tell her to, when it gets tight, when the rope gets tight, put your foot on the gas gently. The rope tightens. I say, put your foot on the gas gently, just gently in reverse. She does. The truck comes out very easily. The woman in the black truck and I, women can do these things. The woman in the stuck truck is still hysterical. And just a tiny bit stuck, but she could have gotten out. She puts and slams her foot on the gas. Before I stop, <sighs> she has smashed into my car. I have a lot of words. I'm not saying them. She collapses into my arms, sobbing, sobbing. My husband's going to kill me. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Yeah, as I'm looking at my car and patting her back saying, no one got killed, we're all okay. I give her all the information. I give her my husband's information, his cell phone number, his home number. I'm certainly not telling him while he's on the slope. We exchange our information. I head back to Mittersill and I call my son because now I need to decompress because my car has just been smashed. I tell him the story, tell him the whole story. And his comment was, oh, that poor lady, she's having a bad day. Son, you are talking to your mother and clearly you haven't fallen far from the tree. Well, I'm not wasting the day. I go off. I do some shopping. I do some getting a nice coffee. Bob calls. He's ready to be picked up. I said, okay, I'm on my way, but I do have some news to tell you. And he says, oh, you mean about our car being smashed by the truck? I said, yeah. The lady had messaged my husband and told him on the slope. The car was okay. And you may have thought I was okay, but internally we had to come home. First off, I had to face my husband. We had to call the insurance. I felt bad, it was my little car that I got smashed. A week later, I received a note in the mail from a dear friend. 
because I was still trying to piece together, did I do the right thing? Should I have stopped? She would have gotten out. I felt bad. I mean, now I put my husband in a situation, we either have to fix the car, sell the car, buy a car. The note that came in the mail from my friend was a card that her mother had sent her. And it says, I never have yet had a twinge of regret for being a little too kind. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. That was another good story. Appreciate it very much. Uh, for our next storyteller, we have Joan Park. Joan Park is very unique because she's led at least 10 different lives and always has had a positive attitude towards everything that she does. She's a graduate of Simmons College, where she was a medical professional and a bio and um, pre-med student. She then went to Harvard and was a researcher there under their medical teams. She was in the Boston Ballet, was both a dancer and a teacher. She was an ice skating instructor. She was a professor at the University of Lowell where she taught metalworking. She got a craftsman's degree in silversmithing. She's been around very, very long and very, very interesting jobs. One of her biggest challenges though was parent parenting two racially diverse adoptees. And she has up and down stories. Some of them could make a person very, very angry. But because of Joan Parker's completely unique point of view, she finds joy in humor, in things that would really, really stress other people. I'm sure you'll find out that this will come out in the story. Joan, please tell us what's cooking. Thank you very much, George. I don't know that I found a lot of humor much of the time in this. But anyway, this is my personal Black history. Um, in 1966, I adopted my son, and he was racially mixed, but racially mixed definitely means Black around here, maybe everywhere. Anyway, I, I wasn't too aware of what was happening in Boston because I was so excited about getting him. I already had a daughter who was three. Anyway, at this time, Judge Garrity had ruled that the Boston School Committee had set things up. So there was one set of schools for black children and one for white. Unfortunately, it was now, un oh, actually fortunately, it was con unconstitutional. They kept saying the schools were equal, but they weren't equal. And now it was unconstitutional. So to solve this, they had decided they would have busing. At the very first school they went to, now I'm going to say some words here and I have to tell you, this has been cleared with the Southern Poverty Law Center. The children were met with signs saying, nigger go home. Pictures of monkeys. Rocks were thrown through the windows of the bus as well as at the bus. When the children got off, to go into the school, they were spit on. And they were being spit on by adults, not other children, because they were already in the school. Additionally, the next thing that happened, my parents told me that I could not go home again. They lived in Boston and they were very much against the whole adoptive thing. Now, shortly after this, my daughter was starting nursery school at Carlisle Country Day, Four Acre Country Day School here in Carlisle. The woman across the street had called up all of the other children, uh, the mothers of the children in the carpool and suggested they change so they wouldn't have to have their child in the car with the black baby. None of them changed, fortunately. About 10 months later, a friend of mine who had met my son said she had always wanted to adopt a child. And she had adopted, actually, an American Indian baby. She happened to need to be at the police station for something or other. In Carlisle, it seems like we have these reasons to go, mostly dump stickers. Anyway, the chief was there, and he took one look at her and the baby, and he said, oh, don't tell me. And she said, 
what do you mean? What do you mean? What do you don't tell you what? And she said, don't tell me Joan has adopted another one of those black bastards. So now <clears throat> to get to a more positive thing, um, the head of the adoption agency had suggested that the five couples who had adopted children form a group to support each other and also to let other people know that immediately available in the Boston area were over 2,000 children who were either racially mixed and it was many different racial mixtures or had some other problem, but they would be adopted, could be adopted within two to four months. So we put together a group and called it Families for Interracial Adoption. Um, we developed literature, we developed um, speaking engagements, and um, we tried to get the information out and did get the information out at such a level that two years later, over 1,500 children had been adopted or uh, facilitated by our group, and including my own um, daughter who became yeah. part of our family. Now, I'm going forward again. When we were vacationing seven years later, we were at Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, my daughter, Laurel, was out on the raft with my son, Jacques. And when they came back in, um, Jacques was slamming doors, kicking things, and generally just absolutely furious. And I, I said, you know, what is going on? Because Jacques never told us anything about what was going on in his life. In fact, in first grade, when I asked him um, what he had done in school today, he said, I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> well, he never did. <laughs> anyway, um, so I said, Laurel, what is going on with him? And she said, Mom, I think it's because when we were out on the raft, some kids were going by in a canoe and they started pointing and calling him nigger. <laughs> so, it goes on like that. I'm going to go forward many, many years with many events in between. When my daughter Ari was about 20 and she was an EMT, she had to bring a woman down from the fourth floor who was very hefty. And the woman took one look at her and said, I don't want you here. Why aren't you out picking cotton with the rest of them? Well, she still took the woman down. Now, the first time I gave this talk, the um, Philip Markle, who was directing this, said, well, don't you think things have changed now? And I said, I, I just didn't think things had changed that much. But when I came home that day, I read an article in The Mosquito that I had missed from the week before. And it was about an incident that had just happened at our own Concord Carlisle High School. It seemed there was a presentation on the blackboard and somebody had drawn a racially unacceptable image on that blackboard. So do I think things have changed around here? Not very much, not right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. That was a good story, and I apologize. I I missed characterize it as humorous. I really meant that your style is upbeat, positive, <laughs> and okay. strong, not humorous. <laughs> I, I do apologize. No problem. Okay, good enough. Uh, our next speaker, our last speaker, is Chris Akiapella, and he is not a Russian fellow, but he is distinguished because he is a Russian language perfectionist. And he became a Russian language perfectionist because of uh, poor eyesight of all things and because he didn't want to die in a nuclear exchange. And he, the reason why his eyesight had something to do with this is because there was a famous Russian ophthalmologist at the time who was doing radical surgery, a new surgery, in order to correct nearsightedness. So Chris said, well, that's the place for me. I want to go and get my eyesight a little better. I'm going to go to Russia and be his mentor and become like him, an ophthalmologist, and help people who are nearsighted like me. Kind of interesting take. Uh, nuclear Holocaust, he, the language was so good that he was, he was called upon by the CIA, by the FBI, by the National Security Agency. They wanted to make him a spy. 
But he figured, no, a spy is, you know, sort of like pro-war and he's anti-confrontation. So he didn't want to take the job like that. So he never became a spy. What he did become is a, a, a Russian company, commercial consultant, helping United States firms that wanted to have commercial uh, endeavors with Russia. And that's where he was shining as a consultant. Well, this is a story about how as a consultant, as an American consultant to companies in Russia, he got involved with um, trying to rent a property in the center of the most, most difficult, difficult agency in Russia, where they um, um, allowed him to actually open a shop in, in an institution that was the most anti-capitalist uh, institution in Russia. Uh, Chris, why don't you tell it in your words, because I'm fumbling and mumbling here. Thank you. Well, thanks, George, and thanks, everyone, for coming. And uh, it's nice to have a chance to tell my story. Uh, I always thought it was pretty funny, but as George mentioned, uh, from 1987 to 1990, I worked for the State Department, the former USSR. Uh, I was actually there when the Berlin Wall came down. Um, and as George said, I'm fluent in Russian. At one point, I controlled a $19 million field budget for the U.S. Information Agency's Exhibit Service, and I had made a lot of contacts with nascent private entrepreneurs and businesses in this role. Uh, subsequently, I hung out a shingle and tried to make a living as a consultant for U.S. companies eager to do business in the former USSR in the early 1990s. During the summer and fall of 1991, I teamed up with a couple of other Americans uh, to create a trading company, and we made a trip to the former USSR, where we spent a week meeting uh, making and renewing contacts to explore possible trade opportunities. Everyone agreed that we should try to open up an office in Moscow. Uh, we learned through local contacts that real estate prices were amazingly cheap, so we spent several days at the start of our trip looking at various possible office locations. Unfortunately, most of the cheap locations were incredibly shabby or nearly inaccessible, so and any that were actually suitable for the office of a Western company were almost as expensive, if not more so, uh, than office space in Boston. Uh, dispirited, but not ready to resign ourselves to a shabby location or high prices, one of the members of our fledgling company, Sam, uh, Samir was his actual name, an entrepreneur with both Soviet and US citizenship, made contact with a friend of a friend who said he had an exciting possibility in an excellent location. So Sam made plans for all of us to meet the following morning. And he was on the phone first thing in the morning with the indirect contact, who he assured us was a big player, uh, knew everyone in Moscow. After several minutes on the phone, shouting over a tenuous uh, connection, uh, we overheard Sam asking incredulously if the other party really meant Red Square. So Sam hung up the phone and told us we need to get to a corner in Red Square by 10 o'clock near the entrance of Goom. Uh, that's the State Department store. Uh, and it's adjacent to the Lenin Mausoleum. Uh, we all assumed that the individual, individual probably worked nearby in government offices, and we would proceed from there to the location of our new office space. So we headed out. Now, Goom was a late 19th century architectural marvel, combining Russian medieval and modern styles. Uh, I reminded Sam that we'd already gone over this and been shown some prospective office spaces in Goom, and they were ridiculously expensive. Sam assured us that his contact was not taking us to see offices in Goom. So, okay. A few minutes before 10 o'clock, we arrived at the specified location and stood in a small knot, uh, conspicuously attired in business suits and ties. It was a late fall day, and the sun was shining, the air was still warm, but no longer humid. Throngs of tourists wandered by snapping photographs. There were long queues of people waiting to enter the Linden Mausoleum to view the carefully preserved remains of the USSR's founder, uh, Vladimir Lenin. The visitation of Lenin's embalmed body in a glass case was essentially a rite of passage in the former Soviet state. Uh, it's roughly equivalent to a devout Muslim making the pilgrimage to the Hajj. Some Japanese tourists asked me if I would take their picture and hand me their expensive camera. Uh, they then assembled with the goom ent entrance in the background, and I tried to take a picture with the sun essentially behind the subjects of my photo. It's like, okay, uh, before I could destroy too much film, 
uh, my partner Vadim tugged on my sleeve and told me that Sam's contact had arrived. We had to leave now. So I hand the camera back to the Japanese tourists. I apologize profusely and turn around and um, Sam's contact was there. It arrived promptly at 10. He, Sam quickly introduced us and we immediately started off at a brisk pace. Vadim and I strode rapidly behind Sam and our new contact were engaged in a rather animated discussion as they headed directly toward the London Museum which was closed and had a heavily armed guard blocking the entrance. Our host stopped short, directly facing the guard. I turned to Vadim I say, what the heck are we doing here? He glanced at me with his eyes wide and shrugged, turning his attention to the guard who had hoisted his Kalashnikov in a somewhat threatening manner. Museum closed. The guard shouted imperiously, threateningly. Our host addressed the guard quietly and I heard him mention someone's name. The guard then lowered his gun and waved us past him into an alcove at the entrance where our host pressed a button on an intercom, announced our presence and who we were there to see. Okay, I thought to myself, it's a friend of a friend of a friend situation and the real player works here. I resigned myself to a long day of shuffling between government bureaucrats and being shown office space at inflated prices that we couldn't afford. After a long pause, another armed guard appeared at the door, opened it, and let us enter, shepherding us brusquely through a metal detector and opening inspecting our, and inspecting our briefcases while our host stayed outside. Uh, once we went through security, the guard approached an older, graying, thick-set man in the classic garb of a Soviet bureaucrat who introduced himself officiously to us as the museum director. Great. I thought to myself, the overseer of the holy shrine commemorating the life of the person who would create an entire society on the basis of opposition to capitalism is going to give pointers to a small U.S. company on finding a commercial office space in Moscow. And this is going to be a real hoot. The director shook all our hands warmly and told us we'd li he'd like to give us a private tour of the museum, the, the London Museum, before we had our meeting. Uh, we thanked him and explained that we were somewhat limited in time, perhaps could schedule something for after the meeting. He seemed mildly offended, but undeterred, and led us up the non-functioning escalator to the second floor. Uh, apologizing for the sign on the escalator that said, under repair. They explained it, that it was merely turned off to conserve electrical power while the museum was closed. We assured him that was no problem. We were all healthy young men, and we marched up the escalator. At every turn, there were obvious museum employees standing attentively by various exhibits, looking at us, whispering to each other, or walking singly in, in small groups quietly. The director introduced us to some and pointed out the significance of the exhibits, uh, which we dutifully nodded and made appreciative sounds. We then entered a corridor guarded by an older gentleman with an armband who eyed us hostily, but after speaking in an angry whisper with the director, shrugged his shoulder at us to indicate his consent to allow us to pass. Then we entered the director's office where a matronly woman was preparing a table with tea and various sweets. And the director offered us, to, offered us to please help ourselves. He then settled himself behind a massive and ornate wooden desk, explaining to us that it was a desk that Len himself had used. We all nodded appreciatively and Vadim commented fluently on the desk's merits and historical significance. I knew that these sort of pleasantries could go on interminably, so I then stated our interest in finding office space in Moscow. The director said, oh yes, my colleague informed me of your request. We are very interested in helping you. Sam then said, oh, we've already looked at uh, some spaces in Goom, but they're really expensive. We we're looking something near the center of Moscow that would not be so costly. Vadim agreed and added that we were a small young company and did not need an extensive amount of space given our limited budget. The director nodded understandingly. Oh, I quite agree. My colleagues and I have discussed this among ourselves and decided that we would like to offer you space here in the museum. Let's go and take a look at what we have available for you and if it would suit your needs. My lower jaw is still stuck to the floor of the Lennon Museum where it's been for the last 30 years. That's my story. Thanks so much.
Thank you, Chris. Appreciate it very much. <clears throat> well, that concludes our first annual storytelling event from Carla for this evening. Um, this segment today will be mixed or edited with last week's segment to make one continuous show for this event. And that'll be available on YouTube when it's finally edited. So please contact the COA for that YouTube link uh, if you're interested in, in viewing it or sharing it with your friends and neighbors. Secondly, uh, this is only the first event, supposedly next year, or hopefully, we'll have the second annual storytelling event. And if you're interested in joining that family, then just also contact the Carlo um, Council on Aging. And so, so we're making a roster for next year's class. So that's it for tonight, and that's it for our storytelling. Thank you for watching, and good night.